I have another budget bushcraft knife I want to share with you today. Today it is the Hultifors Heavy Duty GK. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this very inexpensive yet very capable knife, keep watching. All right, just before we get started, I want to send a special thank you out to Jackie and Martin, the owners of good to go Co. in Vancouver, British Columbia, especially Kelly, who helped me out with the purchase of this knife. I did buy this knife from good to go Co., but they did cover the shipping to get it to me, so I do really appreciate that. And I'll be putting the link to where I purchased this knife from them in the video description below. So the short backstory why I have this knife at all is because not so long ago I reviewed another Halt of Fours budget bushcraft knife, the Craftsman. Very small orange handled knife. I'll put a link to that review at the end of this one. And at the end of that video, I opened it up to you, my viewers, to suggest some, uh, uh, suggest some more budget, craft, uh, budget bushcraft knives. And the first one that came to most people's list was this one, the Halt of Fours Heavy Duty GK and I do have the other knife with me so we can compare them. I can show you some of the differences as well as many many similarities. All right what I'll do is I'll bring the camera down a little lower, bring it in a little closer, we'll take a look at this knife, I'll go over the specifications and then of course we'll do some demonstrations with it. All right let's take a quick look at the sheath and then we'll bring the knife back into the picture. So I did make a modification to the sheath right now you can see these, this loop of paracord. I'll explain why. Uh, simple polypropylene sheath, very much like the other one that was from Halter Fours, and you know, very much identical to anything that you're going to purchase from Mora as well. In fact, I think they are direct competitors or the direct comparison at least for the Mora knife. So what it is that I've done. So the one thing about the Halter Fours sheath that is, uh, it's a little bit, well, it's up to you whether or not you think it's something you like or not. The belt loop is a fold over to the front. There's two little small see if that's catching in the light here, two little small attachment points here where it snaps into place. Now you can see it does have the traditional buttonhole loop on it as well. So if you do have work pants that have the buttons on them designed for this, you can snap it right onto your pants and let it dangle there. But if you're looking to put it on a knife or on a belt, look how thin that is. And it's short in this direction and it's very thin in this direction. It won't go on the pants that I'm wearing right now or in the belt I'm wearing with my pants right now. So what was the solution for that? Actually, I couldn't have come up with anything simpler. And that's simply, this is just a loop of paracord. I opened up the plastic piece, laid the loop across it and closed it. Now I have what looks like two wings or two loops coming out the side and I can slide my belt right through there. And you can adjust it to hang as tall or as low as you want to. And with 550 paracord, you're never gonna break that. And what I like about this is of course, not only can I adjust the length is, it acts like a dangler because of the nature of the paracord. Very, very simple solution to just a small issue that comes with the sheath. Now, I want you to keep in mind, this is not a fault of the knife. This is the way it was designed. And remember, this is a work knife. It is a budget knife when it comes to bushcraft. It's a budget knife, period, at $15.99. I, think, I don't think I mentioned that yet. $15.99 Canadian at the Good To Go Co. Company. So yeah, it's, I'm not faulting this at all. That's what you have to do when you buy a real inexpensive knife. You have to look at it and say, what things do I have to change to make it a little bit more of what I want. All right, let's bring the knife back into the picture and go through the specifications for it. All right, overall length for this knife is 8.74 inches, 222 millimeters, blade length 3.7 inches, 94 millimeters, blade thickness 3 millimeters, which is 0 0.1 two inches. The material is reported to be Japanese high carbon steel hardened to 60 on the Rockwell scale. It is weighs at a mere 4.3 ounces, 123 grams. The handle is a injection molded polypropylene. Yeah, okay, so it is a hidden tang design. And well, there are a few other things that we'll go over for about it right now. So you can see what I've done. I might as well address the, uh, the what I've done to the handle. This, where is the other knife? So I can show you the differences and the comparisons. So the handle on the GK, is very much the same as the handle on the Craftsman. It's that polypropylene plastic. It's got a slight texturing on it, but not much of anything. And what I found is that it was just a little bit slippery. Now, it didn't seem to bother me as much on this small knife. And the reason being is 
The guard at the back and the front just seemed to lock my hand in a little bit. Now, it is small, and I'll do some side-by-sides in a moment. So it didn't seem to bother me as much until I got this one, and then I could feel the difference because this is a much larger knife in every dimension. The fix for this could not have been simpler. I went into my tool room. I grabbed, well, what ended up being the last little bit of my roll of, it's called self-adhering silicone tape. And it can be used for all kinds of things, wrapping up handle, handles on hammers or anything else like that. It can be used for uh, securing leaks in a, in a faucet or things like that. It's, it's a really kind of a neat material. I'd recommend you look it up. I picked mine up at Canadian Tire and it just adheres to itself. When you stretch it over itself, it grabs on and stays on. And what's nice about it, it's not expensive and I can take it off at any time. It hasn't unwrapped on me so far, so you know, that's fine. You can use it to build up the bulk of a knife if you want as well. If you find it's just a little bit small in your hands, uh, this was a pretty good size all by itself. But what I did need is a little bit of texture, a little bit of grip, and that provided it. Okay, so here's the basic knife. It is a hidden tang, as I mentioned. It is a Scandinavian grind on it, but it does have a micro secondary bevel. It's just kind of a polish on the very edge. Remember, this is a working knife, not necessarily a crafting knife. So having that secondary bevel goes a long ways to making the edge that much stronger. Still very easy to sharpen. And if you want to put this to stones, you can take that right off and have a pure zero grind Scandi if you want. Something else you may want to do. I haven't had to do this yet, but I may do it. They come because, again, it is a budget knife intended for working purposes. The, a lot of the refinements we expect on our, especially custom knives or even the better quality bushcraft knives, is a nice, sharp 90-degree spine. Uh, one side of this has it. This side actually has a burr on it. The other side is rounded. That's because it's left unfinished. But a lot of the mores come exactly the same way. Very easy fix. Take a file, very fine file, run it across the back of the spine until you're happy with the edge it has. You can even run it across coarse stone if you want to. Do exactly the same thing. Like I said, so far, I haven't needed it with this one or with the other one, the Craftsman. They, actually, the Craftsman came with a very sharp spine. All right, let's do, there's one other thing. Okay, I might as well address this right now as well. Again, refinements is not what this knife is about. It's about mass production to produce a quality working knife. We as bushcrafters just happen to like this for our needs, but we would like some things to be better about it. And here's the one thing that I found that was just, um, how should I say, it's aesthetic, not functional. I'm gonna see if I can bring the tip in close enough and it will show up there. I'm a little hard to see if that's showing up on the camera. The grind is a little higher on one side than the other. Now, maybe I can show it this way. Look at the grind right at the tip here and look at the grind right at the tip here. I wondered if this was a one of, you can, in, hopefully you can see it, a little higher up here than it is here. Now, it's still sharp right out to the tip, so it's not as if it's functionally gonna do anything. It's just when you look at it and say, oh man, you know, that's, that's not perfect. Again, it's a budget knife, I keep saying that. If I had this, this was a custom knife or even a production knife that I paid a lot of money for, I'd be very disappointed with that, of course, but it's not, and I'm not. I'm not disappointed given what this knife is all about. Then I took a look at the other one, the Craftsman. It had a little bit of an offset as well, and I said, wow, that's okay. I wondered if this is common or not. I reached back out to the Good To Go company, and Kelly actually went into the storeroom, pulled out a bunch of these knives, and she said, more often than not, that's the way it was ground when it came from the factory. They didn't give me a special one. This is one right out of their warehouse, so it's good to see that you know I wasn't treated special in terms of the knife itself. Uh, again, I appreciate them covering the shipping. It's just that that's the way the tip came. All right, so let's, those things are out of the way. Let's do some comparisons, and then I'll do what I like about the knife, and of course, we'll do some demonstrations. So here's the Craftsman, the Halter Force Craftsman that I reviewed. It's actually a very small knife. It's actually a small enough and light, light enough, un, enough that I can carry it as a neck carry. In fact, that's the way I have it set up with this sheath, is so I can carry it as a neck carry. The design is identical, but look at the difference. Okay, I'm gonna have to bring the knives back a little bit. First, I'll show them this way. Look how much bigger the GK with the green handle is from the Craftsman. You can see it in this dimension. Let's see if I can bring the blades in end to end. Now the blade length is identical, but look at the thickness of the GK, the top spine to edge, much thicker, heavier duty. The material is a little thicker at three millimeters. I believe the uh, Craftsman is 2.5 millimeters. 
the handles is where the difference is. Now, how's best going to show this? Once again, look at that. Look at the difference in length down here. So I have them together at the top and at the bottom, you can see just how much longer the GK is. But it's not only that, it's also, now I know it's, not, it's going to be a little unfair because I have the black tape around the GK, but it's much bigger all the way around. But for me, with my extra large hands, this is a proper size bushcraft knife, made even better by just that little bit of silicone wrapping around it. There's so much to like about it now that I've actually wrapped that around it, or even before, other than the slipperiness with this knife that I thought, man, this is where it beats Mora out all the pieces. This is a knife for a guy or a girl with big hands, for sure. It also has the ramp right up here, right? Look at that. It was, you would think they would actually designed it for that. In fact, I think they did, but it's perfect for using a place to put your thumb. And that's true on both of the knives. That's, the, that's continued over. Yeah, it's, it's so much the same, just beefier and more heavy duty, which means it should take more abuse or more, let's, I don't want to call it abuse because I don't abuse my knives, but more heavy duty use. So let's do exactly that. Let's put it to the test. All right, first test will be do some batoning. Now, you know, the traditional wisdom is with a hidden tang knife is that you should not be batoning them because you risk breaking the knife off at the tang. And there have been situations where that's occurred. However, I believe if you stay within reason, you can do that. And this is inch and a quarter, maybe 10, 11 inches long. Um, this is well within the wheelhouse of what you can baton with this. I wouldn't go much heavier because I don't think there's any need for it. This is not a primary knife for wood processing. It's more of a crafting knife, but let's just split this down. I am going to baton this into a number of small pieces so I can take it on to the next test. So I'll do that. I'll make this quarters, maybe even eighths, so we can do some more demonstrations. Right, I chose one of my splits to make a 10 peg out of. Normally I do testing by batoning the uh, knife cross grain into the stick just to touch the, test the edge for strength because it's usually a little harder to go cross grain. I think this time I'm just going to do it freehand because it's a small stick and uh, it just needed to show that you can do this freehand as well of course. So all I'm doing is working the knife into the wood creating a stop cut that should be enough and just very easily cleaning out the stop cut and as I say this is just representative of one type of notch an L7 I say L7 because it's referred to as both of course but it's a simple notch to create, and what it does is it creates the place for your guy line and your tent peg to hold on to. But of course, we still have to put a point on the end of it, so let's do that. So this demonstration is all about the controllability and the comfort of using the knife in a reverse grip like this so that I can create the point on my tent peg. And it's just using the chest lever method of cutting. We'll just cut a point to it. Well, that's most of the point creating with one cut. So what I'm looking for in the knife is not just how easily it will bite into the wood, but just how comfortable it is when I do this, All right, that create when in to create a point. And where I'm looking for is where is the heel or the beak at the, te uh, at the pommel uh, going into my hand? Is it going to create an uncomfortable hot spot by pressing into my palm? And this knife handle is big enough that it doesn't even touch the back of my palm. Well, it does, but just ever so slightly. So when I have the pressure on it and I'm pulling in this direction, I don't even feel that. No, not at all. It's just, it's a, it's a pleasure to use like this. All right, that's a couple of demonstrations. We have to, of course, do some feather sticking. All right, one uh, task that we expect from our bushcraft knives is to be able to create feather sticks. Now, feather sticking is more of a skill of the person itself than it is of the knife. It's more about choosing the right bit of wood and getting some practice on the knife that you have with you. But uh, some knives just make it easier than others. So let's see how well this knife does. So the piece of maple that I have, does have a few knots in it, so I won't be able to make a huge feather stick, but I think I should be able to get a few curls on this for demonstration purposes. Let's see, I wanna make sure I stay in frame. Maybe I'll turn that down a little bit like that. 
All right, so the first few that I put on are about establishing a, uh, a hold on point for where the feathers will, so I, so I don't knock them off. That's the basics. Okay, I'm already hitting that knot. Let's see if I can get right underneath it. So this being one of the splits from that other piece that we just had a minute ago, I'm working down the center of the piece of wood, which right now is still the heartwood. So I'm not getting a lot of super fine curls. Let's see. All right, that's a bit better. Go a little longer. You can see the knot where I'm starting to jump over the knot. And whenever you jump over a knot, you tend to lose your curl. So may have to work on the outside here. But I'm getting curls. See if I can get some really fine ones. So it's just a matter of angling the edge forward or backwards for it to bite as well as angling the, the whole knife. Let's, trying to make some really little ones here. Just to keep the demonstration from getting too long, bigger curls, little tiny curls, the ones that catch a spark. All right, another task is scraping. So being able to scrape with your knife is one of those things that is really, really useful to have. Now, as I mentioned, this has an unfinished spine. It does have a bit of burr on this edge, so hopefully it's gonna do the job without any modification. And what I like about scraping is you can scrape any number of materials. First, I'm gonna just scrape a little bit of this maple off to create a little bit of fuzz. And then, of course, I have my fat wood. And then, of course, I'm gonna light the fat hood with my ferrocerium rod. I do have a little piece of leather just to catch things on here, so. Well, I'll say right off of the top, I've had better knives that will do jobs of scraping better than this, much sharper along the edge. Whether I got lucky with this knife or if this is representative of a lot of the knives, of the two knives that I got from Holter Force so far, uh, the little Craftsman is a better scraper than this, but that was just the luck of the draw. So I could hit that directly with a spark if I wanted to, but I'm going to set that aside. Take a little piece of birch bark, and now I'll see what we can do with the fat wood. Again, it's doing the job. Enough. Well enough is probably the best way to say it. I think I probably, when I get home, I will hit that with a file just to get it a bit sharper. See if we can, not as easy as some. Okay, let's see. There we go, all right. But it still worked, still worked. All right, those are the tasks and demonstrations. Let's wrap this video up with a few closing thoughts. You know, all things considered, I think this may well be the best value for a bushcraft knife on the market today. $16 Canadian, and I know that elsewhere it could be purchased cheaper than that, but the, the, I don't know of anything that you can purchase of this quality for $16. Yes, you can spend more on a knife and get much nicer knives than this, but I don't think you can spend $16 and get anything as nice as this. Now, it's not a beautiful knife by any means. It's not something you're proud to show your friends, but it is something you're gonna reach for when you want a functional knife that you don't mind using hard and know that it's gonna perform. You know, I think this is every bit the equal to any of the Mora knives that I own, and I have a few, and I have a few more I have yet to show in videos, but they'll come eventually. Yeah, this, this, and one thing about this knife, it fits my hand better than any Mora ever has. That's, that's, yeah, that if you, I've said this before, if you have bigger hands on the extra large size, this is the one you want to get. Get this, and if you have to do a little wrapping like I did just for the traction, uh, you won't be disappointed with it. Okay, I said all things considered because there were a few cons to this. One, it's an unsharpened spine. Again, 15 or $16. The edge isn't perfect, or the tip isn't perfect in the grind. Again, $16. <laughs> I keep saying that because those things, I can't do anything about the grind. Well, I could with a bit of work, but I can certainly make the spine of this a little sharper, and it just remains a highly functional knife and an extremely good value. Okay, uh, 
I will put all the information I've shared in terms of the specifications for the knife as well as links to where you can purchase this knife. The link I'll give you is the one to Good To Go Co. in Vancouver, British Columbia, but you can purchase them elsewhere if you can find them. And I just another, again, a thanks to the good people at Good To Go Co. for covering the shipping for this knife. And you know, maybe that's the one con, at least for us Canadians, is shipping. This is not an expensive knife to buy, but it would have cost me just as much as shipping. So that's why I'm thankful for the shipping. We have expensive postage here in Canada, to say the least. Okay, that's all I have for you today. If you have any comments or questions about the Hultafor's Heavy Duty GK, please put them in the comments section below. If you have any other suggestions for knives you'd like to see me review, especially budget knives, please put those in the comments section below. Until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.